you actually have servers mm -hmm. and uh, you do have volunteers, but mm -hmm. you also are developing the, the core infrastructure and yeah. I'm sure that can't be done on a part-time basis. You're actually running an organization. How, do, how does that work? Yeah, so all the editorial content is created by volunteers. We could never afford to pay. I mean, we wouldn't pay those people. It's a gift economy. We don't need to pay those people. Um, but we could never afford to. I know that traditional journalistic institutions are having real trouble figuring out how they're going to fund journalism going forward. And the primary problem is that editorial work is really, really expensive. Right. So we have 150,000 Wikipedia editors around the world. We could never afford to pay 150,000 people. And that's driven by the individual's passion, their mm -hmm. knowledge, their commitment. Very often it seems that, that, that a lot of these editors are themselves expert. They're not part-timers. They're, yeah. they're, they're experts in their field. They're writing about things that, they, that, that they've spent their entire careers learning about. Yeah, I think th that is true and it's also true that they tend to be people who are involved in, um, in education. A lot of our editors are graduate students so they're reading and thinking and absorbing ideas and reflecting them back and thinking about them and writing term papers right. and essays and so forth. So they're people who are very much involved in the world of scholarship. So the editors, we don't pay, we can't pay, we would never pay, they don't want to be paid. I think that their motivations, we've studied them a little bit, and their motivations are partly just that they're smart and they want to be known to be smart by people, so it's a bit show-offy, right? It's like I know everything about this kind of rock or this mollusk or whatever, right? And they want to share that. And it's passion. Yeah, and that's, and that's fantastic because other people do benefit from it. What the Wikimedia Foundation does is we do, we pay the bandwidth bill and we pay for the servers, right? So about half of our budget goes to technology in the form of bandwidth servers and um, staff developers and staff sysadmins maintaining our operations. The other half of our budget goes to other support for the projects that's essential. So for example, Wikimedia Foundation um, has a staff general counsel mm -hmm. who's an old school free speech internet lawyer who defends us and defends the projects against various you know, legal disputes that we might otherwise get ourselves into. He looks after those for us. Um, we also do quite a bit of public outreach work. Increasingly we're doing public outreach mm -hmm. work. Uh, the volunteer community um, is stable and it's strong and it's reasonably healthy but we think that the Wikimedia Foundation has an obligation to constantly attempt to broaden it to reach out and bring in new people so to recruit new volunteers and also to help to um, retain the volunteers that we have today we haven't done a lot of work in that area historically we've only had a head of public outreach for about 18 months um, but we think that there's a lot of fertile terrain there and we think we can do a lot to broaden out participation in Wikipedia. So for example, 87% um, of our editors are male, mm -hmm. only 13% are female. That's not a good thing, right? That's not healthy. Right. There, there are a hundred different cultural reasons contributing to that. It's nobody's fault. We're very, very grateful for the 150,000 folks who we have. But we think the encyclopedia would be richer and more diverse and broader if it contained more perspectives from more kinds of people. A better example even, probably, is geography. Wikipedia is skews, the editorship skews to Western and Northern Europe and to mm -hmm. North America, and we don't want to become an encyclopedia or a property where people in rich parts of the world tell people in poor parts of the right. world what truth is, right? We want to contain everybody's truth, everybody's experience. We want to be just as detailed and rich in our articles on India as we are in our articles on the UK. What you're, what you're basically shifting in that, in that attempt is, is how the dialogue takes place. Instead of having the dialogue move from those with the means to produce the dialogue and to disseminate the dialogue, you're actually democratizing those means production of dialogue becomes so much less expensive. The infrastructure is provided as long as there's an internet connection. The threshold for, for being heard is reduced to such an extent that you're actually shifting it from being very often what turns out to be a monologue from the yeah. wealthier countries, geographies, mm -hmm. to the less wealthy countries, to being much more of a balanced dialogue. Well, that's the goal, right? And I think that it's aspirational. We do have editors all over the world, obviously, right? So there are people editing Wikipedia everywhere. 
but I think nonetheless, our, our conversations take place and our participation takes place in rich parts of the world, and it does that for obvious reasons, right? right. Stable, fast internet connections, um, good penetration of the internet everywhere, a good, strong educational system, and I think maybe most importantly, Individual editors in rich parts of the world have the leisure time to engage in a project like Wikipedia, right? right? Clearly, if you're worried about basic needs, you're not editing an encyclopedia, you know? We've made outreach efforts to poorer parts of the world, and they have limited success because of exactly that. The context is just so different, right? right. So one of the things that's on our agenda for the Wikimedia Foundation to be doing over the coming couple of years is to partner up with NGO organizations in poorer parts of the world, not the very poorest parts. We don't think we can help in the very, very poor countries, but in countries where there is some internet penetration and some educational system where there's a tradition of free speech, a tradition of revering knowledge. India, for example, is a, is a terrific high potential country for Wikimedia. We think that if we can strengthen awareness of Wikipedia a little bit and build some networks of people on the ground, there's a chapter, we have an international network of chapters, and there's a chapter in development right now in India, and I'm very excited to see it come to fruition, because I think it's going to be really powerful for us. So we feel like that's part of our job, is to reach out and ensure that Wikipedia isn't about rich countries talking to poor countries. How does international expansion get funded? Are those projects that are primarily funded from the wealthier countries, the wealthier areas, into the areas where there's less penetration, or is it a, a self-funding? Uh, yeah, right now, um, the majority of our funding comes from wealthy countries, and the majority of our funding, as you said earlier, comes from individuals, right? So our average donation is, I think, $33, $33 right $33 now. $33 annually, yep. $33. Yep, $33, and um, we have about 150,000 people a year donating to the foundation. So I really like that, right? Because there's there's a there's a philosophical congruence there, right? 150,000 editors and 150,000 donors, everybody brings their crumb to the table if it's money, if it's time. I like that. Um, and the the largest group of our donors comes from the United States, which makes sense because we're here, so awareness of the projects is really right. high here, and also because we're able to offer tax deductibility in the United States, not in most other countries. Um, how I see that changing over time, though, we do have a network of chapters which is predominantly in wealthy countries. Those chapters, in theory, aspirationally, are better situated to fundraise in their countries than the Wikimedia Foundation is, right? It just makes sense. If you're in the UK, you understand how it works there. The same for the Netherlands and so forth. They currently aren't very experienced. They're volunteer-run organizations. Mm -hmm. Only the German chapter actually has staff. The remainder of them, they're just volunteers. But over time, I would like to see them become experts at fundraising in their own context. And then what I think should happen is they should, f in effect, funnel money to the Wikimedia Foundation that gets funneled to developing countries, right? It makes sense to me that rich countries pay for programs in poor countries. That just seems logical. We also talk to um, major donors and to foundations in developing countries. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's lots of opportunity for those people to directly fund programmatic activities where they are. But we feel like the Wikimedia Foundation needs to be the first institution in some of those countries starting to help people self-organize before those countries really have networks of volunteers or f networks of staff who can actually you know, execute on programmatic activities themselves. And your idea of a chapter-based organization is not sort of a top-down, sort of a headquarters and a, a command and control operation. Is yeah, that's it? right. What, what kind of a model is it? Is it more of a neural network? Is it more they're, of a... They're independent organizations, and okay. so we're all aligned in pursuit of the overall mission, but everybody can take their own path towards fulfillment of that mission. And that's really important because the Wikimedia Foundation, the Wikimedia movement, is not centrally controlled. It's not, it's not a command and control environment at all, right? And you've seen that from yes. watching Jimmy, right? I mean, he's very, he's very careful not to exert his authority in, in, in really authoritarian ways, right? He's very gentle. He's very nudgy around the edges. More of an influencer. Yeah, very much so, yeah. And that's the only way it can work for us, right? That's the only way it can work because they're, they're volunteers and they're there for their own reasons. And we don't need them to all have the same motivator or to have, you know, the same results. The benefit of the decentralized network is that it lives 
it lives in each place. So if something goes wrong in the UK chapter and it has a problem and it can't continue, that doesn't infect the Dutch chapter, the German chapter, the Swedish chapter. You know what I mean? They're independent and therefore they can all experiment, they can all find their path, everybody can flourish in a different way, and that works really well for the pursuit of the mission. Well, one of the things that I find very interesting is how the organization has developed in, in contrast to a command and control organization, it is, it is an organization that is based on influence mm -hmm. and influencers. Mm -hmm. It seems that the Wikimedia Foundation and the community, and indeed the various projects, Wikipedia and so on, operate out of influence. And it almost seems that an individual or an idea gains sufficient influence to reach a tipping point, it tips and then action is taken. Very often not when there is complete consensus. It just has reached a, a, a place of influence and then a decision is reached. As opposed to so many organizations that there's somebody who exercises a function, a chief finance officer or, or a chief executive officer, and they might listen and then they become the person who is deciding. That seems to not quite be the way the yeah. whole community operates. No, it's true. It's really interesting. Um, the perfect example of that is our strategy project, which I think you know a little bit about. Um, I, I came in two years ago, so I spent my first year fixing really simple things, right? I, I moved us from Florida right. to San Francisco. I hired a CFOO. <laughs> I did a bunch of simple things that are kind of obvious that any organization needs to have in place. Um, and then I spent my second year um, figuring out how we were f doing financially and making sure that we were okay and getting a number of grants and so forth and moving forward some programmatic activities and experimenting in a bunch of ways. And so now I'm at the place where I'm ready to start setting some serious priorities and moving some things forward. So I was talking with my board about that and I knew that in, in our organization, the Wikimedia Movement, there were two ways that I could go at that, right? I could do it in a conventional way, right. in a boardroom with my own staff, and in that way I would drive the activities of 30 people in San Francisco and a guy in Amsterdam and a guy in Sydney, and that wouldn't have a lot of transformative power, you right? You might have been leaving your 150 editors yeah. behind. Yeah, well, there would be 30 people aligned in doing something, right. but 30 people is not very much, right? So clearly, in our context, in the Wikimedia context, there's way more power in influencing a, a huge group of people in a small way even, right, than there is in exerting traditional command and control authority over a small group of people. Right. So we decided that what we would do is we would run a strategy development process that was open, completely open, completely public, completely accessible to anyone that would therefore take advantage of a number of things. No smoke-filled room. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no back room at all, <laughs> you know? It's all public. There's a, there's a wiki, strategy.wikimedia.org, and it's public. And, and what that means is, one thing is we can take advantage of everybody, right? So people love Wikipedia. I'm constantly charmed by people's amount of goodwill towards it, right? I've never worked somewhere where people felt as positively towards the organization that I represent. I love that. So people want to help us. All kinds of people who we would never guess, you know, from around the world want to help. So this enables them to just come in and help. And the other thing that it does is it enables the whole thing to be seen and to be visible. So getting stuff done is all about alignment, right? It's all about we're all going to go in this direction. We're not going to go in 150,000 directions. We're all going to go in one direction. I know we will not come out of our strategy project with 150,000 people all, you know, lined up like Chairman Mao's army or whatever, right, and, and plunging down a road to something. But the more information that people have, the more understanding they have of the activities that other people are conducting, the more they can channel their energies constructively. I don't need to know what they're all doing, right? I don't need to know what Thomas Dalton, 25-year-old Wikipedia editor in London, I don't need to know how he's spending his time. I don't need to exert any authority over how he's spending his time, and vice versa. But if he knows what I'm doing and he knows what I'm thinking, and I know what he's thinking, it's much easier for us to work in concert, right, in, towards the same goals. So we've just begun this project. Um, we, we're currently forming task forces um, of people to work on things. We put out an open call for participation. There are several thousand people already actively participating on the wiki. They're going to do their work over the next six or eight months. Um, I'm already starting to see the shaping of the conversation happening in really useful ways. As part of the project, I should back up just a second. When I came to Wikipedia, 
um, there was no high level understanding, there was no story, right? Everybody was very engaged in their own little piece of work, but no one had a really high level there view. There were 150,000 stories. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And, and you knew the stories of the people adjacent to you, but you didn't have a big picture sense. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to drive over the last couple of years is the development of that story so we understand each other, we understand what we're doing. Right. Um, and as part of the strategy project, we've hired a firm called Bridgespan um, mm -hmm. to, to create high-level views on data and research and analysis. So it's been able to tell us some really simple things, but things that if I'm a Wikipedia editor who spends five hours a week thinking about Wikipedia, I don't know, for example, that we do really, really poorly in China. How would I know that? I may or may not know that participation has been relatively stagnant since about 2006. I might not know that, right? There are a lot of things about how things are working, what's working and what isn't working, that it hasn't been my business to find out for myself. So now we are able to give people that high level data set, mm -hmm. that piece of information, and then they can take that, talk about it, and figure out what to do about our poor performance in China, what to do about our relatively poor performance in India, how do we manage our organizations so that um, we can properly channel the will of the volunteers across all projects, how do new projects get started, how do we maintain innovation in media wiki. So bringing people together, giving them some information, and then trusting them to have good conversations, because they're smart people, they really are, um, and then make good decisions out of that. that that's what we're going to be doing in the strategy project. Now, does this process, because it sounds very process intensive, does it, does, it, does it stymie or delay concrete action? No. People um, contributed a whole bunch of proposals of things that should get done mm -hmm. to the wiki. That was our first step. And the first thing that we all said to each other was, nothing is stopping anybody from doing any of these, right. right? So if you read one of them and it sounds interesting and you can contribute a piece to that, just go and do it. And the whole process is designed to be porous in that way, right? So you're not waiting for somebody to, you're not waiting for the conclusion if there's sufficient consensus, you move forward, yeah. and you're not waiting for somebody to be given command and control responsibility for this. People are just invited to go do it, let us know and report back. Or not even report back, or, right? Like we'd love it if they report back. But I mean, even in terms of our offline usage, part of the challenge of the free license mm -hmm. is that nobody needs to report anything, right? And that's, that's the right. huge benefit because it's just one less piece of overhead, right? That, that is a disincentive for people. So obviously it's a good thing, but it's a little bit of a challenge for the Wikimedia Foundation because we're being used by hundreds, thousands of entities all over the world. We don't even know, right? I guess when it comes down to it, our preference is rather that things get done and good stuff happens, mm -hmm. rather than that we know about it. Do you ever find yourself in a position in which your brand or your, your name or your, your uh, information has been appropriated for purposes that are not free um, or that, or that um, where you would have to exercise the same type of authority over, over your own image, your own name, that a corporation might, might have to? There have been a couple of instances of um, <laughs> trademark infringement and so forth, right? And trademark infringement is complicated for us because the trademarks are really the only thing that we do own, right? right? Because the content is free and anyone can use it. So the trademarks are really the only thing of value that the Wikimedia Foundation itself actually owns. But we try and take a really light hand with that kind of thing for obvious reasons, right? We, I, I believe that um, an organization's brand or an organization's reputation um, is the accumulation of the 20,000 things that it does every day, right? So you get the reputation that you deserve. Um, I don't think it's easy to control your own reputation, and I don't think that there's a lot of point in trying to control it, particularly in a decentralized context like Wikipedia. Um, I would rather have people behaving in the projects in whatever way they see fit, talking to the media, writing the articles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and have the aggregation of all those tiny behaviors be what Wikipedia adds up to. I think it is today, right? I can't, we can't, like, it's hilarious to me because we really can't, for example, shape the media message around Wikipedia. We have one communications guy working for the Wikimedia Foundation. He can barely return people's phone calls, right? So he's, he's the department for the fifth largest 
He's, he, he's your whole public relations department. Yeah, but not just largest public largest relations. He's everything. He's issues management. He's he's branding. He's communications. He's every function, right? Every communications related function. So as you can imagine, he does not exert an enormous amount of top down authority over managing our message, right? But we think that that's a good thing. We think that you know people will know us and they will understand us based on our actions every day. And we trust and we're confident that the the Wikipedians around the world who are working on the project are excellent ambassadors for us because they're there for the right reason. They're, they're altruistic folks who are giving back, giving knowledge freely. I mean, there's nothing, there's no downside. <laughs> and, and in terms of the evolution, the future evolution of, of uh, Wikimedia and, and the various projects, one of the things that I find to be very interesting is that you are now competing with a whole range of commercial organizations um, some traditional, trying to get into the information business, the, the online information business, and trying mm -hmm. to figure out their new models. You referred to uh, journalistic enterprises. Um, but you're also competing with other organizations that are spending hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of dollars every year on research and development. Now, you're not spending hundreds of millions on research and development. How, how do you see that working? Do you feel that eventually that there is a risk that, that commercial organizations could see just having access to this content and having control over this content would justify um, almost a leapfrogging uh, Wikimedia in, a, in, a, in, mm -hmm. an, in an attempt to make it irrelevant and to mm -hmm. capture that audience that mm -hmm. you have? Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's a complicated question and there are a couple pieces um, of an answer to that question. Um, one issue is do commercial endeavors want to do what Wikipedia has done? And the answer to that obviously must be yes, right? Because if you could monetize the audience, 330 million people a month, you could make a lot of money, right? So a lot of corporations would love to have that kind of audience and to monetize that kind of audience. Um, we don't think, though, that anybody is ever going to be successful building an encyclopedia that displaces Wikipedia. I really don't, right? I mean, first mover advantage, and it's huge, it's massive. To try and knock it out of its perch now would be enormously difficult. And we've seen properties develop that are kind of similar in some ways to Wikipedia, and they don't flourish in the way that it has. I mean, it, it's, it's a long established property Don't now. you also have an attitudinal issue in terms of your editors are there for a, um, for a set of values yeah, as well. Yeah, that's right. And our editors aren't necessarily solely loyal to Wikipedia, which is completely fine, right? Some of our editors work on other wiki-based free knowledge projects. They work on other projects entirely, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't necessarily only volunteer with us, but you're right, they do volunteer primarily um, for altruistic reasons. They want to make the world a better place, right? Um, we know for example, every now and then um, the issue of commercializing Wikipedia comes up. And we've always said the same thing. We've always said we're never saying never, but not right now and unlikely, right? So we don't, we don't imagine that we're ever going to commercialize it, but we would never take it entirely off the table because if it were a choice of shutting down Wikipedia, which will never happen, but if it were a choice between that and commercialization, we would consider commercialization. We know, though, that one of the downsides to commercialization, and it's pretty major, would be we would lose a lot of our editors. They don't want to be involved in a commercial money-making endeavor. They don't want to make some guy rich, right? They're doing this out of the goodness of their hearts because they want to make the world a better place, right? So there's that piece. So there's the piece that I don't think other entities will ever displace Wikipedia, right, right? in that sense. Um, I think our best path to innovation um, is uh, open collaboration, right? The so, open source movement? Yeah, and, and we, have, we have a pretty active group of, of technical volunteers, media wiki developers, mm -hmm. who are doing extraordinary things. So for example, recently one of them created something called the abuse filter. The abuse filter? The abuse filter. So Wikipedia is very frequently under attack, right? If you're like a 12-year-old kid, right. you want to write 
you know, Jimmy loves Sally or whatever. We could be, you know, <laughs> so so they're constantly blanking pages and writing nonsense, and uh, not just kids, but you know, all sorts of different people. I was angry at my dry cleaner, so I'm thinking of that, that's right, <laughs> trash talking them on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. And there's the self promotional piece. There's a whole bunch of ways in which people want to interfere with the encyclopedia, getting out their political messages, whatever. Basically, it's people who don't understand that it's an encyclopedia. They want it to be a platform, and they know that they can edit it, and it'll magically appear to all these people around the world. And so there's constantly people doing that. So this Australian guy who is still in school, I think he's a first year university student, wrote this terrific thing called the abuse filter, which um, detects abuse, anticipates and detects abuse in various ways, maybe 20 ways, um, and then warns people who've abused and reverts their abuse and or flags their abuse to other volunteers. So it's this incredibly complicated, wonderful little tool that basically helps Wikipedia editors protect Wikipedia against vandalism, right? He created this you know, in his spare time because he's an extraordinarily smart kid who knew he could do it and wanted to see if he could do it and lo and behold he actually did it. So the inventiveness um, of, of the Wikipedia open source developers is going to be what enables us to continue. Well that's interesting, so you're not stopping the publication of an article, you're simply saying there's a high probability that this is simply abusive material, just take a look at it and then it depends on what it is i think i think the abuse filter automatically reverts for example if a page goes from having 20 20,000 characters to zero characters mm -hmm. so someone's just blanked it i think it does automatically reverse that but it tries where it can where it makes sense it tries to actually warn people and to sort of say to them you know what you did is not necessarily what the encyclopedia is for <laughs> i want to think it over and yeah uh, and and there's a there's a a filter for a whole bunch of words right which we probably can imagine not belonging in an encyclopedia, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it tries to warn, it tries to do a little bit of coaching of people, so if they're just honestly making a mistake, they're not really understanding where they are, maybe it can support them in becoming more constructive. It does a number of things like that. And the future of Wikipedia, are you going to expand the, the, the reach you've talked about, international mm -hmm. reach? Mm -hmm. Uh, the languages you've also um, implied mm -hmm. as you go yep. as you go increasingly go global. You've talked about um, increasing the the types of editors that you've had. You've talked about the the fact that most of the editors currently are are men, and you'd like to expand that uh, so that uh, more women are also editing. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of of different types of devices, are you are you planning to go into um, different types of, of, of devices, phones and, yeah. and other? Uh, yeah, we have to have a much stronger mobile presence and the reason for that is obvious, right? In a lot of developing countries, people are never going to go through a PC stage, right. they're going to go straight to phones. We have a mobile presence, we have a variety of mobile presences, we need to do more in that regard. One of the things that worries us a lot about mobile um, is that it's hard for us to imagine large numbers of people editing on mobile phones, right? right? It's possible to do, we know people have been doing it, um, but not a lot of people. It's a hard thing to do. And we can't quite see our way clear to imagining that people are really going to construct entire articles and add references and images and so forth mm -hmm. from mobile phones. So that exacerbates our concern about rich countries developing information mm -hmm. for poor countries, right? If poor countries are using phones, we, don't, we, we need to figure out ways to help them engage with us better. We have a whole piece of work to do I think activating our, our, our devs, our, our developers, um, and, and building up that community as well, they are our great strength when it comes to innovation. They're incredibly smart, they're incredibly talented, they're excellent programmers. We need more of them. We need, again, as with the general editor community, we need to find better ways and develop better ways to, um, to recognize them, to acknowledge their contributions, to encourage them to contribute more. I was fascinated last year. In April, I was in Berlin, um, and there was a volunteer devs meeting, and there were maybe 35 uh, volunteers from around the world um, who came to hack away and talk technology and stuff. And I was amazed because they came from all over Europe, and some of them came from further. One uh, female developer. So these are developers? Yeah, they're volunteers. They're right. just volunteers. One came from, uh, from Washington, DC. She lives now in DC. The prior year, I think I had seen her in Alexandria at Wikimania. She goes around the world engaging in this Alexandria, Egypt? Yeah, in Egypt, yeah. We had Wikimania, our annual conference there. So okay. she was in Alexandria for that. 
back now in DC and then came to Berlin for this conference. She's 22 years old or something like that. Like clearly this is important to her, right? Mm -hmm. And she's important to us. So I would like to see us find more ways to support those people so they can be even more powerful and helpful to us than they are today. Even little tiny things like scholarships to conferences, right. like our tech conference, right? Just small ways that we can acknowledge and support them and keep them engaged with us because they are the future from a technical innovation perspective for us. The Wikimedia Foundation will always do lots of technical work, but really what's transformative and what will keep us keeping pace with the Googles and the other massive technology organizations is our network of volunteers. And you're also moving uh, increasingly into uh, multimedia uh, mm -hmm. materials, video. We do have um, increasingly um, video on uh, Wikipedia and in fact we don't think that video will ever be the core material on Wikipedia because text is so much infinitely more manipulable right and you know you can share it much more easily and you can get it with with low-tech devices and you can print it in books and all that stuff um, but there's no question I mean I know from my background in TV right there's no question that sometimes an image is infinitely more powerful than words right so as an illustration of something that's happening as, as a conveyor of the emotion, as a conveyor of narrative. Um, video, video has a place on Wikipedia and it hasn't been sufficiently exploited, so we do want to do more of that. Where do you think you'll be in, in five years? Where I would like to be, I don't think we'll be here, but I'd like to be, is I'd like Wikipedia to be in the top five web properties in every country in the world. And the reason I want us to be that is because Popularity is a measure of relevance and a measure of usefulness, right? There are countries where, for example, China, we're not even in the top 100. We're right. not sufficiently well known by Chinese people. We're not sufficiently trusted by Chinese people. The Chinese Wikipedia is not big enough to be particularly useful. So my view is, if we're in the top five, that suggests that we're relevant, we're high quality, it's a rich enough encyclopedia that you look for something mm -hmm. and you find it there. I like the idea that all around the world, people would find Wikipedia useful and relevant enough, sufficiently, that it would be one of the first places that they would go when they're looking for information. That is a very concise strategic mission. <laughs> five, uh, the top five mm -hmm. in every country in the world. Mm -hmm free information for all, an amazing, amazing project. And I am just stunned sometimes about uh, how this all comes together and how wonderfully it, it, it seems to work. Thank yeah. you so much for coming. You're welcome. Thanks, Mark. Mr. Gardner, thank you.